So before I um, begin the program, I wanted to tell you a little bit about the project, the, the hotel project. Together with the, Maria Mingalone and I and the Ocean Beach Side Beach Resort team, we curated almost 3,000 artworks by 110 artists, hailing from Los Angeles to the Valle de Guadalupe. Our curatorial process honored um, Oceanside Museum of Arts curatorial mission, which is to uphold and support and champion Southern California artists. We also honored the branding and sensibility of each hotel. And uh, we also, um, we were really conscientious of gender parity uh, as that was very important to us and a really strong representation um, by diverse voices as well. Uh, we commissioned very large scale artworks, uh, large scale installations ranging from uh, ranging from elevator spaces to to uh, to ceilings to pool bar decks, and we really honored uh, emerging artists as well as established artists. We also purchased paintings and sculptures, and also uh, licensed prints. What was really special about this partnership is that the Oceanside Beach Resort three years ago reached out to the Oceanside Museum of Art to really connect to the community and also to support and champion artists both locally and regionally. We have three of those wonderful artists tonight um, from the hotel project and in a moment um, they will do some self introductions and then also um, after that we will I'll, I'll ask a few questions and then we'll open it up to the audience as well. Uh, I wanted to let you know why I selected these three artists in particular, not to mention that they are uh, all women. And as again, as I spoke to the gender parity of the project, um, it's really interesting to see how that might inform the work that they do or not. But what I really see in common is they both have an architectural and organic approach to the work they do. Um, they, uh, each of the projects in the hotel utilizes a weaving process and speaks to themes of the ocean and nature. And also um, they really incorporate shadow play uh, and, and temporal and uh, you know time-based elements, um, be it the shadow that's crossing at a certain time of day or the way it's lit, um, for example. But what I really am interested in exploring tonight with these three artists is the intersection of, of community-based social practice with uh, maybe perhaps art activism and how those two might intertwine or diverge. So with that, um, I'm going to introduce uh, each artist in alphabetical order, and then they will speak a little bit about um, their work in the hotel and more, and then I'll start the questions. I wanted to just give you a little background. I am actually a Canadian, uh, Canadian born and raised in Montreal. And my family history is in textiles. Um, so I, I feel like even as uh, a trained architect, I'm always thinking about how to weave ideas together, how to weave community together. And um, yet in the art practice, uh, it's, it's really a, a literal weaving, but in, in an architectural sense of that word. So the work for Mission Pacific Hotel, which is in the lobby, is actually called Lure 2, which um, is a weaving of um, elements that fishermen use. And in this particular case, stainless steel fishing weights for their, um, for their uh, fishing lines. And we repeat the use of those elements, very simple, inexpensive elements over and over and over again to create a piece that has a breadth, a repetition to it. And I think, you know, it, for our practice in the arts, it's really a combination of an understanding of structure, uh, mathematics, um, artistic endeavor, and the scale of architecture. So. We, even though trained as architects, uh, I think that uh, we bring a certain sensibility to the artwork that's really intricate. So architecture takes a long time to make and these pieces do as well. Um, we also work in the realm of the arts and graphics in, in the public realm. And so this, this is a, a series of signage pieces that we designed for the San Diego Central Library both external and internal. 
um, each one honoring a donor um, to, to the project itself. Very, very fascinating project. Um, intricate again, working with our fabricators who um, we make buildings with, but in this case, it's artworks. Then uh, this year we'll be um, opening the Mingay Museum in Balboa Park as something we have been working on for six years and uh, working as an architect, but also in as, as an artist. So in this case, it's a fence that we designed for a courtyard a series of bronze um, pickets that are twisted and hand patinaed, and they really create a line of an artwork um, within the context of an architectural space. And hopefully the community is curious and wants to come up and touch and feel and maybe even caress, we don't know. I <laughs> <laughs> um, think going back a while uh, collaboration is a big part of both the art and architecture practices. And this was a collaboration on a building that we designed uh, with a landscape architect named Claude Cormier from Montreal. Um, it's a trellis uh, that really becomes an expression of nature, um, trees, the sky being blue or hopefully blue on certain days in Michigan. And um, a really amazing piece of 65 separately designed tree branches all made of resin and fiberglass. And then finally, infusing the architecture work with uh, notions of art and particular texture and detail um, this is a project from 1996, which was um, executed in, with the developer of your hotel, two hotel projects. And there's a sort of sentimental value to coming back to working in the hotel uh, because he and I worked together that long ago. And this was an apartment um, and particularly a stair and its details um, within that. And then within that same project is Lure One, the first version of this, which uh, in 1996, we built it out of fishing weights, but they were in this case uh, made of lead. And um, that's probably not something that we want to do anymore, <laughs> but at the time <laughs> it felt good. And so uh, I'm really excited to have taken this piece from that many years ago to translate it to the 21st century and to share it with our community. Great. Wonderful, thank you, Jennifer. So let's move on in, as I said, alphabetical order, Michelle Montjoy. Hi, everyone. Welcome. My name's Michelle. Hi. Um, I live right here in Oceanside, just a few miles from this space. So I was really honored to be chosen. Um, my work was in, is in what's called the pre-function room. It's a gathering space that's right before the ballroom. So when I was thinking about this piece, I thought of this room as really this liminal space. It's liminal, it's in between inside and outside. It's before you go into this big um, event that you might be a little bit nervous about. So I thought a lot about bridging that gap and bridging it with organic forms against a geometric you know, of the room. I thought about movement. Um, they told me that windows and doors would be open. So I knew that these pieces would move with the outside breeze. And so um, that was really the beginning of all of that. Um, I hope that as folks spend some time with it, as they're waiting for their event or whatever, that they look up and realize that these are made from used t-shirts. So I get these t-shirts at the local disabled veterans and my friends and family, the disabled veterans thrift store that's on Coast Highway, along with friends and family. And they represent all sorts of times um, throughout Oceanside, turkey trots and church camps and everything else. Um, and so I was thinking that by bringing these shirts into this space, I, I wanted to acknowledge the stories and histories of Oceanside in a small way. I'm, I'm trying to use a humble material to tell this beautiful story of our place from the Luceno to the fun zone that used to be there to the Marines and the pirates and they're all knitted together in this piece. So I make art in a lot of different ways. You can hit the next slide, Adam. Thanks. I do um, what's called social practice or socially engaged projects. I do this, um, I've been doing this for a number of years. It kind of grew out of my teaching that I used to do 
in Vista. And um, this one was with a Creative Catalyst grant and Oceanside Museum of Art. It was called River. And in this, I engaged over a thousand people from 32 different places and we knitted on these giant hand-built looms. I'm also part of a collective called To Do, a mending project. You can, there we go. And um, in this project with Siobhan Arnold and Anna O'Kane, we mend clothing, but we also bring dozens of volunteers who teach what they know how to do in free workshops at museums, galleries, community colleges, and all sorts of places like that. I also work in public art. I've done pieces like this, which is at Liberty Station. The name of this title of this piece is A Dime to Call Home, and it references the shifting identities of um, Navy folks when they go in and out of service. I, let's see, what's our next one? And then I was honored to be part of the show, being here with you, Estando Aquí Contigo, exhibition that was at MCASD in 2018. In my home studio, I make small objects, drawings, embroidered pieces like these. Um, I use common materials that are embedded with histories. With I use humor and whimsy and absurdity and I'm trying to find entrance to larger, harder conversations about women's labor, inclusion, environmental issues, and capitalism. Oh, thank you, Michelle. Wonderful. And now I'd like to introduce Akiko Sarai. Akiko, if you could please share your background. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us here tonight. I'm really excited to be speaking with you, Rebecca, and with Jennifer and Michelle as well. I'm broadcasting to you all from mid-city San Diego, so still Kumeyaay land, just a little further south than Oceanside. The piece that I created for the Mission Pacific Hotel is called Pacific Stratum. It's made up of acrylic glass and polyester and nylon rope. I wanted to create something that had a sense of organic movement, worked with repetition, and kind of honored the history of Oceanside too, being um, an area that's really affected by the ocean, really affected by the ports. A lot of the, um, the materials that I use are based on things that are simultaneously architectural, but can also be repurposed into something that is a little more playful and um, sort of those materials at rest is what I wanted to get at. So the techniques that I'm using combine a marine grade rope and embroidery techniques to create this um, cascading arrangement that is really investigating autonomous objects, connection, interdependence, and um, bringing a sense of movement and playfulness to the space. Wonderful. I also have a piece yeah. in the Seabird Resort from my series Oracle that I made in 2017. Those are collage-based works that are interrogating liminal space and um, how art and uh, art can be an entrance to a thought process and engaging with art can be something that influences like the possibility model of what life can be. So I'm thinking about glamour, communication through images and liminal space as a space of possibility. Outside of my practice as a studio artist, I'm also really involved with activism. Over the last year, I've been working with the Cancel the Rent Coalition here in San Diego, and especially with ACE, the Association of Californians for Community Empowerment. This is me in my studio space with some of the banners that I've created that I've run in the San Diego Union Tribune, the Washington Post, the New York Times, all around um, housing justice, uh, especially for people impacted by coronavirus. I've also worked as a museum educator. This is me with some of my students in the Extended School Partnership Program at the Museum of Contemporary Art San Diego. I worked with MCASD for four years and got to work directly with up to 700 students a year sometimes, bringing them through the installations, using art as a tool to teach critical thinking and as an entry point into the experience and thought process of others. So here we are in the show, Scripts for the Pageant with the artist, Nancy Lupo. She's the blonde woman that's to my right-hand side there. And we're discussing with this group of four girls how they were going to um, touch on elements of conceptual art and apply them to their projects in school. 
some of my other work in fibers. Another collaborative piece actually is this one. It's untitled After Vadodaria. It was in a show called Illuminations curated by Kai Essery at the San Diego Art Institute in 2020. And this was the piece um, that Rebecca and Rainier Milan saw in the gallery and invited me to create a proposal for um, the Mission Pacific work. So this is a nylon net that's stretched over a piece of acrylic glass. And then I'm cutting and mending the net with decorative embroidery stitches. Again, looking at that intersection of like, what is art, what is craft, what is decorative, what is structural, and can those things, can it be a both and instead of an either or? One thing if I'd like to add about that piece is that um, we were very impressed by the way you were able to scale that up mm -hmm. without having done a lot of public art before. It was very impressive. And it that really turned out beautifully. Fun, very fun challenge. Yeah, well, you, from, you mastered it. <laughs> yeah, we went from about 20 by 35 centimeters to 20 by 35 feet. So <laughs> it was great. And it, really, it was just, it, it was um, so lovely to see that transformation and you carried it off really beautifully. So thank you all. And now I have some questions. And the first one I'd like to start with and whoever would like to go first um, to answer this. I really want to ask you, I, I'm, I love titles and I, Michelle knows that because we, we talked a little bit about that, but I, I love titles of work because you really have the opportunity to, um, you know, just even if in a, in a one word or a sentence really describe what you want your audience to uh, experience or think about when they see your work, right? Um, many artists say untitled, um, but there, there are opportunities in it. In this case, each of you do have a specific title for your work. And it's interesting because all the titles to me speak to the idea of uh, social practice. And, and, and for one of you, uh, a art activism, as, as you know, I'm, I'm sort of looking at the, um, etymology of, uh, of one word. So, um, so for instance, Jennifer Luce, her piece is lure too. And the idea of lure, right, it's a double entendre. It's this, you know, it's a fish lure, but you're luring like this idea of collaboration. You, um, you know, even on your website, you emphasize that your work is about collaboration. Mm -hmm. And I really, I, I love that. And so, because there are, so even with the, pro the hotel project, there are many people involved to create a really inviting space. So, if you know, and then I could, then I, so I'll, I'll uh, stop there, and then I'll, I'll ask you to, to you know, uh, to maybe uh, speak to this. And then I just want to say with Michelle, chorus, um, you know, the idea of chorus, right? Of course, is a group. You, you know, chorus is not one person, and the idea of this, of the grouping, of also of collaboration, um, of unity. So I thought that was really lovely that, that, you know, again, there was a connection with the three of you. And then with Akiko, I'm looking at as almost as, as a subversive title because, you know, stratum is, uh, is actually singular and it means layer, right? But it also can speak to class and race as well. Um, the idea of strata, right? The, the levels of society. And so, you know, I'm not sure if that's, if you were uh, infusing the meaning of your work that, but I was, you know, I thought that was a good, you know, topic of conversation um, and, you know, why you chose those titles. So Jennifer is really large on my screen. So why don't we start with Jennifer? <laughs> um, yeah, Lure. So, you know, often we're looking to place to find the inspiration for a piece. And in this case, San Diego is a fishing community, a fishing industry. And so we began just going to shops and fishing shops and boating stores and saying, okay, what are the elements that are really indicative of, of this practice? So the fishing lure became uh, an interesting object in itself. But if you think about the idea of and celebrating the fishing industry here, which goes back, you know, many, many decades, hundreds of years. And um, but this object itself is fascinating. And then you multiply it by thousands and it becomes even more fascinating. But this idea that you lure curiosity, you lure people to gather together. And so each of the pieces is done like a quilt with many, many people 
uh, involved in it. And in particularly for this piece, we spent a lot of hours together talking six feet apart distanced, but talking about our experiences through COVID and, wow. and wow. What, what we were feeling. And so even the act of making the piece is alluring because it's a way of bringing people together. So um, I, I think for all of the work, that is the idea is that we gather people for conversation. And if I think back to my origins of being an architect, that's essentially what, what our real goal is. So, so this is Lure 2, the second version. Um, we learned so much from doing this piece. We cannot wait to do Lure 3 <laughs> somewhere. <laughs> Wonderful. That's very yeah. It's beautiful. It's a lovely idea, and um, and you know the embodiment of the of the ideas is is wonderful. So so either Michelle or Kiko, um, I'll let you choose who would you, who would like to go next and talk about the title of their work and and why that's relevant to your to your practice as an artist. I can. Okay. okay. All right, Michelle. Sure. <laughs> okay. Cool. Well, it's. I, I wanted to jump in because I, I'm seeing the connections now between uh, Jennifer's work and mine. So my piece is called Pacific Stratum and it is another double entendre. So thinking about the layer, but this work is also influenced by the concept of biomimicry. Um, in the time before I created this, I was reading work by Adrienne Marie Brown. She has a book called Emergent Strategy where she talks about um, ways that we can learn from nature and reorganize our lives away from hierarchy and especially the hierarchies that are set up by capitalism. And one of the ways that um, the idea of reorienting away from a traditional hierarchy or a pyramid and towards something that's more like a rhizome, that's more about interdependence and connection than it is about one person hoarding power at the top of a pyramid. So it's stratum in that way, um, a sort of constellation of connections that's non-hierarchical and the the allusion to like race and class is definitely part of it too because these spaces are uh, everybody's interacting with them in a sort of different way and I wanted to draw attention to like the existence of these simultaneous realities simultaneous overlapping realities that are happening um, another thing with the pieces, I wanted to reference how the space is going to be used um, in sort of a more architectural way. So the constellation on the wall or the mosaic, floating mosaic on the wall is made up of these individual objects that are connected, sometimes overlapping, sometimes not, in the same way that the restaurant and the pool deck is going to be made up of these groups of people, sometimes overlapping, sometimes connected, sometimes not, that are creating this shifting environment of the restaurant and the pool deck. Let's yeah, I see somebody in the chat asking for the title and author of the book that I mentioned, and the book oh, is called okay. Emergent Strategy, and the writer is Adrienne Marie Brown. It's produced by AK Press. Excellent. Yeah, I was going to, I'll address these after, you know, um, because I have a few questions to go through. Um, and Michelle, if you could talk about chorus and your, and how, how it relates to your piece and what you, how you want uh, the audiences or guests to experience your work. Yeah, it um, it's been interesting because I've I've I'm an Oceanside resident and it's been um, a bit of a struggle to accept the change that's been happening in our town, especially over the past ten years. And knowing uh, you know my my very good friend is a Luceno and she grew up here in town and and played in the fun zone there. And I my husband teaches at the high school. I've known the histories of the land, but mostly of the people and the, the ways it's changed in the 35 years that I've lived in the area. So for me, I really wanted to kind of grab that, um, that sense of the peoples that have lived in this time. That of course, that's where the chorus, the chorus of voices, the chorus of all the peoples that have been here. So how, you know, how am I gonna symbolically do that? How do I bridge that space between the inside and the outside? You know, this is a private-ish space. So how do I how do I have that connection be made? That's something that's really you know important to me. That we we are all part of this town. Um, 
so for me, that's been a lot of it. And, and just using these everyday shirts, these things that were on people's bodies, they, they almost become an embrace. They're also representative, you know, open mouths of singing. Um, I thought of all those sorts of ideas as I was designing the forms and having them in that space. Wonderful. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, that there were bodies in those t-shirts, right? They're almost like, they're, it's almost like the ghosts or the, or, or what a ghost leave, leaves behind, right? right? Yeah. So uh, what I'd like to talk about next is um, art activism and how that, um, that shows up in your work, if it does. Uh, you know, I was thinking about all the recent events, um, all the tragic recent events um, in just over the past year. Uh, from uh, you know racial issues to the, uh, to um, you know COVID, of course, a pandemic, and and many more really horrific things. And so, how like how has that informed where you're going with your work, the trajectory of your work forward? Is it something that you want to um, address in your work as you move, you know, as you think about your next project? Is there does that inform you know? I've got you again, Michelle, on the screen, very large. So, um, if you want to. If you want to speak to that. Yeah, I, I mean, it, it's an interesting question because for me, there's absolutely no separation. There's no separation between my art and my life. There's no separation between my politics, my feminism, my environmentalism and the art I make. I mean, if I was the, the point of being an artist is to be authentic as, as much as we can. And so this is who I am. You know, I've, I've raised daughters. I'm a feminist. I have all these parts of me I try to just infuse into the work. So it's just absolutely inevitable that I will be an activist because that's who I am. Right, I mean, you do have a big body of work that does address feminist issues, right? Um, it, you, I mean, the chorus is, as you said, is more about the collective, but then you do focus issues regarding women, right? Do you want to speak a little bit to that? Yeah, I mean, much of my work, I source vintage textiles and rework over and within the embroidery that thousands and thousands of unrecognized women have been doing all their lives for their families, for their communities. And so I'm really trying to honor that work that has been invisible for decades and decades. And that's, that's just one part of what I do. But yeah, that's, that's a big piece of it. Yeah. And, and Akiko, I mean, you've been very active regarding uh, rent issues um, and, you know, as you showed us your display of signs, and I know you're very actively involved in that and, and renters' rights. Mm -hmm. uh, so you you are, I would say, out of the group, I would see you as, as uh, the most, um, you know, in, different, in a different way, right, but, the, but very uh, vocal, right, as an art activist um, mm -hmm. as, and what, how you manifest your work. Um, so how... It, well, how have the recent events shaped where you how, going forward? How will that shape your practice? Well, yeah, I have been very active over the last year. And, you know, as somebody who's at the intersection of multiple axes of marginalization and oppression, like it's not something that um, COVID didn't introduce me to these issues. You know what I mean? And um, even with the rent and housing justice things, these are issues that have been going on long before COVID. And it just so happens that this global emergency, like any other global emergency, is hurting the people who are most vulnerable, which is overwhelmingly black and brown people, lower class people um, who, are, who are just not um, benefiting from the same protections that a lot of other people have. It's important to me as an artist not just to illustrate these values in my work, but really infuse it into the way that I operate myself as a business. Um, so yeah, I do invest my time in things outside of my um, art practice so that it's not just about a symbolic thing that lives on a wall that's really isolated from the community that it's speaking about. Banners is part of that. Earlier this year, Michelle and I worked together as a network of home sewers to create masks. We sent thousands of masks to healthcare professionals and to like the Navajo Nation, to people who really needed them. Right. Mm -hmm. um, those projects are really important to me. And I think moving forward, I've been incredibly fortunate over the last year to be able to reorganize my life in a way that's more um, rooted in my values. And I'm excited to continue with that in the future and to uh, really dissolve some of those divisions between high culture and, and the community that I'm a part of. 
Yeah, I mean, uh, what's bubbled up really is this idea of authenticity, right? For the for the two of you, um, and Jennifer, uh, do you see your practice as as a, as a um, embracing art activism as well, or 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 more of the or the community communal social practice? Yeah, I I think that the work um, through its collaboration becomes inclusive. And definitely the work as an architect is about inclusion. And Minge is going to be the most radical point of view of that. We have made so many beautiful things for the museum. We have made um, artworks ourselves for the museum. But I think the thing I'm most proud of is opening it to community, uh, including everyone and beginning an initiative around making the ground floor uh, free and open to the public so that there are exhibits on that level that everyone can come and enjoy, understand, learn, be educated, be inspired by. And uh, that one moment of including everyone um, in, uh, a museum that is art of the people is really, really profoundly satisfying for me. And mm -hmm. as the art artworks uh, develop, hopefully they have the same attitude and understanding. Wonderful. Uh, so coming back to, I wanna come back to the actually the hotel, your each of your hotel artworks and talk about what, um, Hang on, just move this over here. Um, what uh, what are your influences? And Jennifer, maybe if you would just want to start again because you're uh, just finished. Um, what is sort of the, like? If you could talk a little bit about your influences, how you came to create this piece. I know you showed us Laura One. What mm -hmm. preceded that? And what is you know? If you could talk a little, maybe you know, this is a good way to bring in your background a little bit to talk about mm -hmm. how we arrived at this piece. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I think as architects, we make buildings that take a long time to do, six, eight, ten years. And, and the artworks are a practice of exploration, experimentation, and uh, just coming to a point where one understands that a teeny little object of zero value can over a multipli multiplication on a wall becoming something quite profound and beautiful. The way it plays with light and shade and shadow, all of those things are things that we, um, we exercise in our architectural practice, but as art forms, they become really, really um, intense and intimate studies. And so the intimacy of making art is just so fascinating to me. And I, I, I applaud both of you for the amazing work that you do every day. This is not my common practice. This is not what I do every day, but I love it. And for the hotel, I, I wanted people to arrive uh, from a long drive from LA perhaps and understand um, an intimacy and an authenticity about what our region is about. And one of the things is about the ocean, frankly. and um, the wonderful plethora of excitement that happens within it. And then the fishing industry, which has really helped to develop a culture here, uh, a, a really important one actually. So um, knowing that the piece would be at the lobby, I wanted to send a message about who we are as a community in um, a powerful way, because I think we may be misunderstood by um, other places, let's say. And what um what artists uh, or architects um, inspire you to you know and have have they informed your approach in this project? Mm. Yeah, I think uh, two artists or two architects who I just met with in New York last week, Todd William Todd Williams and Billy Sien, who have been my mentors for my entire career. They're in the midst of designing the Obama Library. Um, but they have always referenced artwork, um, infused the work with art and commissioned and supported artists along the way. And that really, really is my passion at the same time as trying to be an artist here and there. And I know it's, it's such a, a wonderful um, and profound um, exercise. And I applaud both of you again for doing it all day, every day. It's just amazing. 
Yes, it, it, indeed, yes. Um, and Akiko, thank you. Um, Akiko, what about you? What What is your, maybe talk a little bit about the trajectory of your influences to bring us to your project Pacific Stratum at Mission Pacific? Yeah, so I started working in fibers after finishing a post-baccalaureate program at the School and Museum of Fine Arts Boston. Before that, I had been trained as a painter, printmaker, and photographer. Um, during my time at SMFA, I was in a, a bad car accident that kind of forced me to reorganize my life and reorganize my art practice. And having that moment um, where I couldn't engage with my work or with the institution of art making in the same way really illustrated a lot of the barriers and a lot of what is sort of edited out of the canon. So that's what started me um, into fibers and into this like, into a more direct way of questioning hierarchy and what, what is and what isn't considered art. And that really exposes a lot of histories of marginalized people, whether you're marginalized because of your gender or your race or ethnicity or class. So I really am trying to infuse all of those things into it. And a big jumping off point was the piece I created with Dr. Krishna Vidodaria for the Illumination show. Um, and that was again playing with the uh, sort of tug of war between what is, structure, what is structural and what is decorative and how that um, hierarchy is kind of imposed on other arts and artists, what is craft, what is art, what is feminine, what is masculine, um, whose, whose labor is really valued. Um, I wanted to keep that undercurrent of labor and community as something in the work, which is um, why retaining the hand was really important to me. Creating the pieces as separate objects was really important to me. So they form sort of a community within themselves. And I wanted it to be obvious that this is something that's made by a person. I sometimes can fall into the perfectionism of wanting everything to be just so on the wall, but keeping the sort of twists and wiggles in it so that um, people could feel a sense of connection and sort of imagine themselves in the role of the artist and thinking about the investment of time and what it takes to build community, what it takes to make artwork and what it takes to really cultivate and maintain connections between people. Um, was something that was really important to me. Some of the shapes came directly from that piece that I made with uh, Dr. Vadodaria. In that piece, it's on a much more intimate scale and I was thinking about healing, growth and mending, not as something that would, if we think of the whole in um, those pieces as a, an instance of damage, right? I started thinking about growth as a sense of expansion and regeneration, not a sense of erasing previous um, experiences or previous trauma. So it kind of ties in with like restorative justice, transformative justice, and trying to create a work that function on multiple levels and could be approached by a huge swath of people coming through the space. Cause I know there will be a range, hopefully a great range of people coming through and experiencing the work. Yeah, uh, and what about specific artists or writers or you know who, who influences you? Okay, specific artists and writers. Well, Adrian, who I mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. I've also spent a lot of the last year um, thinking about ways to cultivate community that aren't restricted by who I can see physically or even like who's alive at the same time as me. So I'm looking into the history of other black womanist, black feminist writers I'm looking at Bell Hooks. I'm looking at the Combahee River Collective. Um, in San Diego specifically, I went to San Diego State for my undergrad degree. So the sort of conceptual artists in the 60s are a good touch point for me. I love Eleanor Anton's work and John Baldessari's work too. And um, that sense of playfulness and humor and uh, the double entendre of it is definitely something that came from being exposed to that in undergrad. Wonderful. Yeah, I, you know, I was thinking about the 30s, right, um, after the Depression and uh, the Delano Roosevelt's uh, New Deal, right, and how artists were taken seriously and paid to, uh, you know, to express their um, concepts and ideas, right, and, and, you know, from maybe what's happening now with everything that's transpired this past year, we're gonna have this revolution as well. Um, I was trying to liken that period to back then. 
um, we can only hope. <laughs> I mean, I hope so. I think art has the potential to change the world. I think of my art as an extension of my thought process and an entry point into my thought process. And with my students, I'm always encouraging them to see it as a window into somebody else's experience and cultivate the empathy that we really need. If that revolution is going to happen, we need to cultivate empathy and tolerance for difference and understanding that these like concurrent realities are all real, all true, all happening at the same time. Absolutely, yes. Michelle, so tell us a little bit about your path to <laughs> the work that you're that's hanging in pre-function and your influence. I don't know all that. <laughs> Holy cow. <laughs> uh, man, good job, Akiko. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, you know, I, I was raised in like the shadow of the 60s and, you know, 70s feminism. And I was mainly in the Midwest at the time. But, um, you know, I, I realized that almost all the artists that I liked were artists who pushed back. So I loved Ava Hess because she pushed back against minimalists. I loved Annie Albers because she pushed back against this idea that craft wasn't art. I loved Alice Neal for just standing up to, you know, yeah, love her. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's like, and I realize it's all because they're pushing back. They're generally women, they're pushing back, they're pushing against things and incorporating their lives in with their work also. So, you know, I, I see that. And I mean, Louise Bourgeois, come on. I was just about to say, time. Yeah, her, yeah. I mean, yeah, you can't not love who she is along with what she makes and the variety of what she makes. And so, you know, artistically that's definitely been an influence um, on me. And then, you know, back to what both of you guys have been talking about, it's about this interconnectedness, about art not being this separate piece from the world. We are the world, we are part of the world. We're, we're the people who are the makers. And um, we're vitally important and I'm gonna stand up for that. And that's why I do social practice where I encourage making and, and how much I think every human needs to be making things in some way or another. We've been doing this since the prehistoric times, you know? Absolutely. So, yeah, so, you know, that for me, um, you know, my piece is just emblematic of, you know, the labor of all of, the people and it, the, you know, knitting itself is an act with my hands and it allows you to kind of get out of your head. Um, and, and then again, I'm knitting everything together. And, and even my pieces are connected up in the ceiling with strings between them. So it's one organism. You know, for me, my activism, my activism is about how inter to acknowledge how interconnected we all are everyone of every being is part of this giant mushroom that is who we are. And, um, you know, we can't live without each other. It's super important. We all need to be acknowledged. And so, you know, that's what I'm trying to think about and infuse into these pieces as I'm making them. Wonderful. Well, you know, that, that is one thing I, I really do love about all of your work is this, the physicality of it, um, because, you know, everything is so, uh, you know, we're inundated with Instagram images, right? And it's all so um, fossil and it's, I mean, it, not the actual work that's being made, but I mean, it's just the easy access, right? And it's great to see the artist's hand in the process of making a work. You know, it's, it's, I think it's a really special, really special thing. So, um, and one last thing, because we're already at 747 and we need to be opening to the audience. Uh, but I wanted to mention, it's just from, from what I gather, you know, it's this idea of authenticity and it's art can change the world, right? <laughs> That's what, as Akiko was saying, you know, uh, it seems like you all it, uh, sort of uphold that philosophy, right? I mean, it, it may sound like a really broad blanket to throw over everything, but you know, you, uh, you you have the opportunity to to maybe change a few minds and maybe then more along the way. Would you say that? Would you agree? I'm, I'm going to stick with the hope. Okay. Mm -hmm. I, hope. I don't believe, but I hope. Yeah. 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 Jennifer, are you going to say something? Yeah, I was just going to say, I'm listening to this unbelievable conversation. It's fantastic. And I'm hoping that somehow we share it with people that come to the space and yeah. we can share the power of it and the uh, personal nature of it because it's, it's just wonderful. 
It really it's is universal. Yeah. Universal. Yeah. And if you can't change the world, maybe you know, offer a unique, special, engaging, enriching experience to those who come in. So, mm -hmm. so well, thank you so much. Please don't go away because we have lots of questions here. So let me go to the top. So uh, let's see. People are saying hello. Um, and let's see. So someone from the board asked from OMA board, uh, did you start by selecting these artists on this panel and then give them a space? Michelle's piece seems ideal for this location, for example. Well, to answer that, uh, we it was uh, a very involved. It was a it was a research process. It, it was about speaking to the space and knowing the community, knowing, uh, as I said, artists from LA to, to the Valle. I'm an artist myself. I know a lot of artists and that's been an amazing thing about this project as well. My knowledge has, has expanded and relationships have been built and it's really, um, it's just been just the most wonderful experience. But really it's uh, a combination of research, word of mouth, um, paying attention to, to branding and sensibility of the hotels. And you know there were a lot of voices involved, and it really it was interesting to reach a decision because so many people were involved in the process. Um, but yeah, it was it's just it really was a combination of, of those things, and uh, you know everyone was really engaged. The process from architects to designers to ownership to the artists themselves. It was a very collaborative, right? It's that again, it was very much a collaborative uh, process. So. Um, Let's see. Uh, someone said uh, about Kiko, so inspired to hear this, Akiko. I appreciate how you correlate the materials and the work to community, social justice, and ecology. Thank you, Chitra. <laughs> um, <laughs> it looks like we um, we don't really have. I mean, just you know, comments about how it's very interesting, but we don't really have any other questions. Let's I see. Think Q and A boxes. Q and A. Oh, okay. <laughs> you look down at the bottom. Of ah, your, thank you. I, I should know like, this by now after a year of Zoom, shouldn't I? Um, okay, here we go. <laughs> to all the artists, how does race, gender, and identity figure in your work? Keeping in mind Oceanside's diverse demographic, is this a thing you consider when creating public work? Thank you. Who would like to take that? I can start on that one. Part of um, part of this idea of offering an entry point and bringing attention to the existence of these concurrent realities is influenced by my own experience. Growing up in San Diego in a very diverse area, being biracial and benefiting from the privilege of racial ambiguity and being able to experience those multiple realities at the same time. And that's something that I wanna bring forth in the work. And I specifically including the hand and showing the labor of the space is something that came into the work later I had originally planned for it to be much more rigid, but I wanted to retain that sense to draw attention to the labor, partially because of the first site visit that we did in October of 2020 and seeing all of the people who were making this space possible and knowing that if they did their work correctly, you were not supposed to know that they were there. And I wanted to like kind of honor their contribution to the space too, um, knowing that many of those people are not going to be staying in these resorts. Um, there, that's just not the stratum that we're belonging to, right? And I wanted to um, elevate that in my work by reminding people that these spaces are made by people, and usually it's by people like me. Wonderful, M Michelle, uh, Jennifer, who would like to, would you like to respond to that question? I think um, just <laughs> naturally. My background is in a profession that is dominated by men. Mm -hmm. And I have made many efforts over the years to allow women a voice in that profession. And hopefully that extends to the artworks as well, where you know, we take a practice of quilting that typically is something that um, was reserved for women in a community. And we celebrate that as fine art. And then we also invite um, men to come and join us in the practice. So I, I think that for me, it's about elevating women to a place of um, importance and a voice in creativity. 
and, and Michelle. Yeah, um, Oceanside is such an amazing town and it is beautifully diverse and it has a super rich history. And all of those pieces, you know, really informed, as I said, bringing in the shirts of all those different bodies and all that. In my social practice work, it's, um, you know, I reach out to neighborhoods, to places, to my community in all different ways. I try to not privilege uh, higher education facilities over elementary schools, over homeless shelters, over, you know, I really try to um, find the breadth of the community um, and invite everyone to those, to participate in those. So that's it's a struggle. I'm not perfect at it. It's definitely something that is in my mind, though, as I'm trying to build and design projects like River and To Do and everything. Well, the, the hotels, too, in terms of the spaces, um, I know that they're working on programming that will really uh, invite, that will engage the communities uh, in, the, in the area, as well as locally and regionally, internationally. So everyone can experience the art, but there are the public. There are several public spaces where significant artworks are that are open to the public. So that's really important, um, you know, to really like to, to make it art for everyone. Uh, let's see another question, um, Michelle. How do you get people interested in part, to participate in your social art practice? Um, I think they're just seductive. I mean, sitting around a loom with people and chatting and moving your hands and touching soft fabric, it's, uh, I have never had a problem getting folks to, you know, again, I come to them. I don't expect people to show up to me. And so, um, you know, in most of these situations. So that's a big piece of it, I think, is just the seduction of the objects themselves, of the act of making, of sitting quietly, of the rhythm and the meditative, you know, piece of that. Um, yeah, I think that's probably the best way to say to get people and bring cookies and be nice and welcome people. And, you know, it's hilarious because my dad was a hotel manager, which I don't know if you all know that's that. Right. But, and I yes. lived in hotels. So the fact that I am now gone full circle into a hotel again is really cracking my whole family up. It's really wild. <laughs> but, but you know, to further what you were saying, <clears throat> there is something, you know, I, I, Michelle and I have started a ceramics class with, um, with, with, with Sasha Ribstein and uh, it is, feels so good to use your hands, you know, because I'm a photo-based artist. And so, and you know, what I was mentioning before about, you know, working in the digital realm all the time. It's been so marvelous. And, and I think it, anyone who sits down and starts using their hands to create something, there's something transformative about it. There really is and meditative and, um, and you know, it's just, it's a, it's a really a wonderful experience. Right. And it, it's such a power, an empowering action. It is. That, yeah. And if we can teach that, I mean, that's why I've been an art teacher for so long, but it's also about learning how to mend your clothes and learning how to fix things. It's all super important um, and grounding. Yeah, absolutely. Let's see. Uh, we are almost out of time, but I, we can look at, let me see if there was one for all of us, uh, for, all, for, the, for the artists. Um, okay, here's one more, and I'm sorry we can't get to everything. Um, but this one is for all the artists. What specific emotions do you personally feel during the creative process and when looking at your completed artwork? I like that question. That's a nice question. Who wants to take it first? Mm. That's a complicated one. <laughs> <laughs> what specific and emotions? What emotions do you yeah, personally I feel know. during? Yeah. Per, what like do you feel everything? during the creative process, yeah. right? And, yeah. and then when it's, when it's actually you know, manifested. It's, this was a two-year project. It was almost like birthing a child. I mean, it, you're excited, you're overwhelmed. You're, for me, for me too. <laughs> yeah, I know, for sure, for all of us, just being yeah. done with this is like, I think I'm having postpartum letdown, you know? Um, and, but every, but then it's also really quiet and it's also really scary and it should be scary and you embrace that risk. And so, yeah, lots and lots and lots of emotions. Akiko or Jennifer, would you like to 
Akiko? Yeah, a lot of a lot of emotions. It's one of those things where um, it's very exciting to see the finished work, but the work being finished also means that I don't have a studio anymore. <laughs> I'm like, now what am I going to do with all of my time? Um, and as far as the process, this work wasn't a social practice work in the way that uh, Michelle's is where I'm directly engaging the public, but I made this in the studio with my sister, who is not an artist. So it was very interesting to see, or not a visual artist, she is an award-winning playwright. Um, it was interesting to see our different approaches to the work. And sometimes one of us would be really frustrated and the other one's talking them down and sometimes vice versa. And we're listening to books and uh, watching movies and listening to podcasts. So there's a lot of conversation and uh, connection that's happening in there. Sometimes it's very frustrating, like when you have to unwrap 400 feet of rope on a piece and start over because you mismeasured. Um, and sometimes you finish it and you're like, hell yeah, I did that. We did that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm sure you're all very proud. And, and Jennifer, what about you? Yeah, I think that it was fascinating to make this piece now because we knew that it needed to be collaborative and we were in the middle of lockdown. So there was right, a sense of that. anxiety yeah. around how we were going to do that. Also the planning stages, the research, finding the pieces, wondering if they were gonna show up. And you, as you know, Rebecca, they showed up over time. And sometimes one singular little lure would show up or a hundred at a time. But there's, there's an excitement around planning a piece like this because you really need to plan ahead. But for us, the emotion of finally doing it together was, uh, it was unbelievable. It was euphoria because we were, we were a group for the first time in a year. And, right. and so, yeah, go ahead. Symbolic, it was it, like, yeah. the, like the completion was very symbolic for you, yeah, I'm sure, exactly. right? Yeah. I mean, it, it was about the end, the, you know, we know COVID's not over, but, but it's a little more manageable right now. And it does, it's symbolic of that. And we figured out how to do it together um, yeah. safely. And that felt like an accomplishment and something really to celebrate. Wonderful. Well, uh, that's the, the word celebrates a good uh, word we can leave off this evening with because it's we are I and mean, we haven't even begun to celebrate the beautiful artwork <laughs> in the hotels, you know, as they just opened ribbon cutting today. And, um, you know, I invite everybody to come and take a look and just revel in, in the gorgeous beauty of, of all, the, all the artwork selections. And, um, you know, I, I, what I, you know, we're hoping for a big grand celebration um, at, at some point. So hopefully we'll be able to do that and everyone can meet in person. And I know that the um, hotel team and Oceanside Museum of Art will be planning really great programming where we can do artist talks, artist tours, you know, there's, there's a, you know, infinite possibilities, workshops, there's all kinds of residencies, perhaps, right? There's all kinds of things we can do um, to have people engage with, you know, your work. So, well, thank, thank you, you all Rebecca. so much. Thank you, thank Rebecca. You, Rebecca. Wonderful. It's really thank you, wonderful, to, yeah. wonderful to talk to all of you so much. And, I, and, and as I was saying, I just want to finish off by, I really enjoyed getting to know each of you and look forward to seeing you at openings again and, who knows? Who knows what the future holds, right? <laughs> yeah. Take good, I, take good care, everybody, and thank you. Kiko, could did you want to? Yeah, could I address something in the chat real quick? Oh, sure. I don't see who this is from, but it says you're all talking about community and public art, but after all, these hotels are business enterprises. They're for profit. It's ideal, maybe unusual, that a private business can incorporate art for community. That's absolutely true. Um, I think we can't ignore the fact that access is going to be an issue with this and I'll speak for myself in saying that a lot of times as an artist I don't have the power to influence an entire project to address access the way that I would like to but part of um, working in a value-centered way is about addressing those things with the resources that I do have which has to do with like using this piece as a portfolio to apply to place pieces that are gonna be more easily accessible to the public and using it as a stepping stone. Like it's it's difficult to approach all of this at one time. Um, I don't see who asked this question, but I thought that was really important and didn't want it to get lost yeah. before we click off. That's good. Yeah, and just to, to further that, uh, again, as I mentioned, 
um, there are plenty of public spaces in your work, for instance, people can just go up there and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, so they can access it. Everyone will be able to see Michelle's work as well as Jennifer's work. And through programming, there will be lots of opportunities to make it accessible to everybody and for and school programming, um, K through 12 school programming um, and, you know, in, interest, anyway, you know, people who are interested in seeing it, there will be ways to see the work and it's connecting also to the Oceanside Museum of Art, there's going to be this idea of a bridge between the, the museum and the hotels. And the hotel, the museum actually has a gallery space now in Seabird, which is open to the public as well. Um, and so, you know, there are lots of ways that the hotel will be addressing mm -hmm. public access to experience the work. Yeah, and I, I also want to speak to that because that's a great question. And, and yeah. some of it is I have to take the long view of my entire practice and say that this could fund or help out with some of the other works that I can do. Um, you know, it is tough being in a private, you know, institution, but um, I, I like to think of it as a long view. Um, Andrea Bowers is a very famous social practice artist who really inspired me to think that robbing Peter to pay Paul kind of piece of this. 